Well, welcome, church. Good morning. So glad you're here this morning. A great time to be a part of the Oakwood family as we are growing to know, love, and live Jesus to the world. Uh, Welcome also to our new series for Christmas called Home for Christmas. Now, I want to ask you this morning, when you hear those words, what does it make you think of? Because these are two really powerful words in this title. Home, which can just mean a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people. Also the word Christmas, which, you know, makes the biggest difference in our lives as Christ followers and as uh, believers of the way, the truth, and the life. And so, uh, man, this is going to be one of those series that evokes a lot of emotion um, and a lot of thoughts as we talk about being home for Christmas. But there's some low-hanging fruit here. Uh, When I say home for Christmas, just for any of you, uh, what does that make you think of? Home for Christmas. Anyone? Anyone? Is there a song about being home for Christmas? Anyone? I mean, we're in a military town. Anyone ever heard of I'll Be Home for Christmas? Anyone? Okay, okay several. Okay, I mean, more, more than I thought. That, that's good. That's good. Well, I, I thought we'd start out today by doing our best rendition of that. And so the words are going to be on the screen. And so if you would just sing along with me this morning, do your best, Michael Buble. We're going to sing this together. I'll be home for Christmas. Now you're being. You can count on me. Please have snow and mistletoe and presents on the tree. Good job, good job. Perry Como now. (laughs) Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. Little Elvis now. And I'll be home for Christmas. Most sentimental now. If only in my dreams. Very good. Give yourselves a hand. I think that was the first Oakwood flash mob, okay? So well done, church, as we were all totally prepared for that. So... Home for Christmas, I'll be home for Christmas. That song has nothing to do with this series, okay? So, but it does make you think of that song, and when I titled the series, it made me think of that song, and I love that song, so. But there is something about that song, and there is something, like, deep down in our hearts that kind of makes us want to be home for Christmas. And for some of us, what does that mean exactly? The, the, this idea that we want to be going home. It it gives us the idea that we have to kind of go there. Now, some of us, I understand we are home. We live in Enid, Oklahoma. This is our home. But for some of us, you know what I mean. We go home for Christmas, right? When I was a child, uh, I had both sides of my family, my dad's side of the family, my mom's side of the family. All of them lived in Iowa. So for most Christmases in my childhood and even into my teenage years, I made the trek up to Iowa, southeast corner of Iowa, Van Buren County. And that's where we had Christmas with family. And I remember my parents always calling that place home. This, this, this is home, and we're, we're going to go up home for the holidays. Even though our home was here in Enid, Oklahoma, we would go up that way. And I remember holiday traffic on I-35. And we had so many cool experiences um, on the interstate. There's a family in our church, uh, Larry uh, Koontz and Janet Koontz and Scott and Tricia were traveling to Iowa as well. We ran into them about every other year at a rest stop uh, near Missouri-Iowa border. And it was so fun to see people like 10 hours away from home on the highway at the rest stop, stop, you know. It was exciting. And there was this holiday hustle and bustle and traffic. And and I remember uh, packing the car, okay. There were five of us. And uh, luckily, my parents owned a van, so we had plenty of room. But you would see people flying down the highway, which, you know, they 
couldn't see out of any mirror uh, or window in their car because their cars were just packed and loaded down. I had a friend of mine that was living in Dallas and went to school with, and he would drive to Austin, Texas for Christmas. That's where uh, he and his wife's families were, and uh, they would drive down to Austin. He was telling a story one time about how he had uh, carried uh, so much in the car. They had a family with three kids in, in a little sedan, four-door sedan, and how one of the years they went down there for Christmas, you know, and, and you know how that works, parents, sometimes that you got to take the presents, you know, and those presents have to go, and then they got to come back. And, and then he said, we were so loaded down, literally, we all had items in our lap. All the way that five-hour trek from Dallas to uh, Austin, Texas. And he said, the first thing we did when we got back into Dallas is we bought a Suburban. And he said, what was so funny about us buying a Suburban is that he goes, our house was 1,200 square feet, and that Suburban was 1,500 square feet. But he said, we never, he said, we never crammed for Christmas anymore. But we all have reminders of that, right? The journey, the travel, the trek that we have sometimes when we're trying to get home for Christmas. Sometimes that's the way it is at the airport too, isn't it? Hey, have you ever been at the airport? Remind me of the guy that was at the airport uh, one time. He went up to the ticket counter and he's, he's checking in. And you know, if you've ever been to an airport, the ticket counter, there's those scales to the right. Right? Okay. And so he goes to the ticket counter. He's working out with a lady at the ticket counter, making sure he's got his flight and his tickets and his connections. And he takes his luggage over to the scales over there to the right. And there's this big sprig of mistletoe there. And so he puts his luggage there and she's weighing it and getting the numbers. And he comes back. He said, this is, I know it's kind of an odd question and maybe it's none of my business, but I'm just wondering what's, what's up with the big sprig of mistletoe over the scales? And she said, that's so you can kiss your luggage goodbye. I thought, okay, that's, that's appropriate, but there's so much that happens at Christmas. seems like we're on the road trying to find our way home for the holidays. But I want you to think about this this morning. Traveling and going on a journey has always been a part of the Christmas story. Let's think about the nativity scene for a moment. Mary and Joseph from Nazareth had traveled all the way to Bethlehem because of the census. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And then you take characters in that nativity scene like the shepherds. We say, well, the shepherds were out in the fields watching their flocks by night, right? I mean, they were nearby, but they still had to travel into Bethlehem. We don't know. Maybe it was just, you know, a few football fields, a few hundred yards. But maybe, maybe it was a couple miles. Maybe it was three or four miles after they had their angelic messengers, they said, well, hey, we need to go into Bethlehem. And so they had a little journey into Bethlehem. And then what about the angels? The angels coming down from heaven and, and being a part of that. I mean, you might have an angel there in your nativity scene, maybe over the, over the stable or off in the background somewhere. But the angels had quite a, quite a trek from heaven to come down to earth to be a part of the Christmas story. And then you know the story that sometime later there were magi. Wise men from the east. It started, most scholars believe, an 18, 18 month to two year journey to be a part of our Christmas story. But it seems that in the nativity and in the Christmas story, everyone was traveling, everyone was on a journey, everyone was pursuing or seeking something. Our text this morning is John chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn there this morning. John's Gospel chapter 1. I know the Christmas story is usually Matthew and Luke, but we're going to read a different perspective from John chapter 1 this morning. As always, you're welcome to follow along in your Bible. Or if you have your phone, your tablet, you can download the Oakwood app and go to sermon notes and all of the notes and, and scriptures will be there for you. But uh, beginning with John chapter 1, we're going to begin this morning reading verses 1 through 5. And it says this. In the beginning, and it's talking about beginning uh, as it is in the beginning of the world. We're going back all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W on Word, because it's talking of deity. It's talking of Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in him, in this word, this logos, this, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. 
the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, so here we have the word. It's a reference to Jesus, and you'll get that here in just a second. And it says that he was life. It says that he was light. And it says there in verse 5, it, it, it tells us that this light is going to be eternal, and it will defeat darkness. It says the darkness has not overcome it. We've got to hang on to that fact in this dark world. But jump down to verse 14. It says, the word became flesh. The word that was back from the beginning. The word that was part of God. The word that was God has now become flesh, just like man, just like one of us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Do you understand this fact this morning that the word became flesh, that Jesus put on flesh, became man, the incarnation, what we celebrate and observe at Christmas, but he did so, it says right here in verse 14, to make his dwelling among us. To make his dwelling among us. You see, at Christmas, we celebrate the reality that Jesus journeyed from his heavenly home to make his dwelling among us us. Now when we read that word dwelling, I want you to understand what it means. The Greek word for dwelling there is actually the word tabernacle. And so it's really saying that Jesus came from heaven to tabernacle with his people. It's a verb. It means to abide, to have fellowship, to have presence, as in family, to dwell in safety and security under its cover and protection. Folks, a dwelling is home. Jesus put on flesh and made his home among us. Why? Because he wants to have a relationship with us. Now, if you think about this for a moment, Son of God from heaven comes down, leaves heaven. What what are we living for? Heaven. Where do we want to end up? Heaven. Heaven. What do we keep our eyes fixed on that gives us hope of eternal life? It is what? It is heaven for us. And Jesus left heaven to come down and to to make a dwelling, a home amongst his people. Why in the world would anyone do that? But if you ponder and if you understand, it's the great love and the passionate love that God has for us. We, going back to the beginning, when the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Back in the beginning, it says that man was made in God's image. And that God wanted a relationship with us. And ours was going to be a special relationship. It wasn't going to be the same relationship that, that God had with, with the clouds or the land or the giraffes or anything else that he created. He created man in his image for a special relationship with him. And he loved us so much and he saw the corruption by our sinful choices throughout the Old Testament. That then he has his son become a man, put on flesh, and come to tabernacle to find home with us. And to me, it's like, that's kind of crazy. But sometimes when we're in love, we do crazy things. When we love someone we want to show them, we do crazy things. I was an RA, residence advisor at Dallas Christian College, my, my sophomore year of Bible college. I had come home for um, an internship during the, during the summer. And uh, Amy and I had, had started a relationship. It was a friendship that had blossomed during the summer. And uh, her, her 20 first birthday was coming the week that the freshmen were moving in. I had to go back to school, and it just killed me that I couldn't be with her on her birthday, um, especially when you were just falling in love with a person. It's, it's crazy. So what I asked dorm dad if I could do was uh, could I lock the dorm up at midnight on that Friday night, drive to Enid, and be back to Dallas Christian College by 10 a.m. when I was to be there when the freshmen moved in. Speed limits at that time were 55 miles per hour on the highway. Dallas, Farmers Branch, Texas, to be precise, to Enid, was about five hours. So I took off at 12 midnight and one second and ran to my car and jumped in it and drove home. I had worked it out with my mother-in-law 
to be someday. Uh, I'd worked it out with uh, Chris and I had asked her, can I wake up Amy about 4.30, 4.45 and say hello, happy birthday, give her a present, give her a hug, and then I gotta go back to school. And she said yes, she gracefully agreed, and that's exactly what I did. I woke up Amy out of a cold stir sleep. She had no idea I was coming, um, and it was great. And, and you think about stories like that, and you're like, that is crazy. Yeah, folks, that, that's crazy. We all smile and all warm and affectionate, and we love each other. But crazier than that is Jesus leaving heaven to come to earth to make a home here with us. For his dwelling among us. Let's read on in verse 9. John chapter 1. It says the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Did you catch that? It's for everyone. Everyone? Because you know you can think of some people right now. You're like, not for that guy. (laughs) No, no, no. Jesus did not come for him. Some of you ladies right now, you're like, not for her. (laughs) If If you met her, if you heard her, like, no no ways for everyone. For most people, some people, maybe just good people, but not for all people. Not for, but that's what the scripture says. That this true light gives light to everyone and was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, this is awesome, the world did not recognize him. What? He came to that which was his own. But his own did not receive him. Man, it seems so positive, you know. And the true light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. But even though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And and though he came to those which were his own, his own people. God's chosen people, Israel. They did not receive him. And it made me wonder, if Jesus showed up at your home today, would you receive him? Because why didn't these people receive him? Were they busy? Were they distracted by the things of this world? Had some of them maybe fallen into this pattern where they they were just so distracted by the things of this world, they love the things of this world, they pursue the things of this world, and all they can ever think about is the things of this world. And they get so caught up in worldliness and, and being here that they're just like, it, it's a struggle. It becomes this struggle that we have. Maybe, maybe that was what was going on with them. That they, they did not recognize him. They couldn't even see him. To some of them, they just didn't receive him. I mean, he comes. It's the Son of God. And you have to understand, they have prophecy, folks. They said the Messiah is coming. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. They, they have all of this prophecy pointing toward this Messiah that's going to come into the world. And yet they did not receive him. And I, th- I know what we like to think sometimes, those of us that are in Christ, we think, oh, but I would receive him. Oh, of course I would receive Jesus. But if we're being honest this morning, are some of us just so far away from Jesus or so distracted that we might not even recognize him if he came to our door because we don't really have a relationship with him? Would we not receive him because we're just too busy, got too much going on? You have to understand that after I pursue this and pursue this and accomplish this and do this and get all of this worldly stuff, then I will work on my relationship that lasts forever. But verse 11 says that he came to his own people and they shut the door on him. You see, many people today are focused on things that are external and not internal or eternal. I think we can get caught in that sometimes. That that many of us today, if we're being honest, we're focused on things that are external, that really don't matter, instead of things that are internal inside of us in our hearts and in our minds, or that are eternal, things that matter for eternity. And when people do this, whether it's from evil intentions and sinful choices purposefully, or it's the innocence of, oh, I'm just distracted by all the wonderment and things and caught up in the things and pursuits of this world, it can lead us away from a path that leads home. And we try to make our way home with something else. Reminded me of the story of the, the four people that were on an, on an airplane. It was, it was the pilot. And then it was one of the most famous VIP politicians in all of the world. And then a preacher and a Boy Scout. 
And they're on this flight, and the, the plane begins to experience some turbulence, and something has happened with, with one of the engines on one wing, and then the other engine on the other wing, and it's rough, and they're all looking pretty scared. And then all of a sudden, the pilot leaves the cockpit, which is never good, okay? Pilot leaves the cockpit, comes back in the plane, says, hey, <clears throat> I've got bad news. The plane is going down, and we've got about a minute to live. He's like, but well, i got worse news is there's only three parachute packs here on the plane. And he said, hey, I'm a dad. I've got four kids at home. They need me. I'm so sorry. I've got to go. And he hits the emergency door, breaks it open, grabs one of the chutes, puts it on, and jumps out of the plane. We got two packs and three people. Then the politician stood up, one of the most famous politicians of all time. He was so wise. And he said, hey, you know, the world needs me. I, you know, I'm, I'm the smartest politician. <laughs> Smart politician. I'm the smartest politician politician in the world. I mean, they need my intellect and, and you know, I, I mean, the world system and, and economy and just the way things run are 100% dependent on me. I, I'm one of the wisest people. We, we, the world cannot stand to lose me. And so he grabs one of the packs, jumps out of the plane. At this point, the preacher turns to the Boy Scout and says, son, I, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I know my eternal resting place and I am ready to go meet my maker. So I want you to take the last pack and the Boy Scout said, hey, hey, preach, don't worry about it. The wisest politician in all the world just grabbed my backpack. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we think we're so smart, we think we got it all figured out, but we can miss it, can't we? We, we can miss it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says it this way. And this was uh, the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy about uh, someone who is struggling in their faith, abandoning the faith. Listen to what he says there in verse 9 in, in the first part of 10. He says, do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Demas was actually a Christian. Demas was a person that had said that they would love and follow Jesus. And yet, what does it say here? For Demas, because he loved this world. He has deserted me. He deserted the Apostle Paul and the work that was going on. And at Christmas, I think this is a great season and a great reminder for us to examine where we want to be and what we want to call home. And after we determine that, that we set the direction and the course of our life on that. Because this is why the wise men hit the road. They saw the star. They understood the prophecies. They understood the gift. And when they saw that star, they started this journey from afar. Matthew 2.2 2 reveals the explanation for why they made that long journey. In Matthew 2.2, 2, they're in Jerusalem, and they're asking King Herod and the court and the people in Jerusalem, this is what they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose. And we have come to worship him. It wasn't that, hey, we've come to make a spectacle. We just, we just wanted to see him. Hey, we're just passing through. Hey, we wanted to be a part of this big event, the star. <clears throat> no, it says that they have come to worship him. You see, they were ones that were searching and finding on their journey, as they're traveling toward home in life, they wanted to find the one who was king of kings and lord of lords, one who was worthy of their worship, one that would actually put on flesh from heaven, come to earth and tabernacle, make a dwelling, make a home with them. They wanted to find a king worth bowing to. If you know the story of <clears throat> what we call the wise men or the magi, if you know the story, then you understand that that these guys were amongst kings. They were serving in courts and knew some of the highest and most you know, influential leaders of this time over, over in the east, over in Persia. But yet they had come because they wanted to find a king who was worthy of bowing to and someone who would show them the way to God, the way home. Now I want to tell you this this morning, is the road... To home with Jesus is narrow and wide. The road home to Jesus is narrow and wide. I want you to understand as we journey toward home that not 
all roads lead to home. I know the world says that. Oh, no, everything. All the religions and everything. Everything leads toward home and eternal life. But that is just not true. Our road toward Jesus is wide in the sense of what we just talked about a minute ago, that everyone is invited. That when Jesus came and made his dwelling among us the light for all mankind, it was for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. Christmas and the Christmas story and the fact that Jesus came, it's for everyone. It's not just for you and for me. It's for everyone. Everyone is invited. And so the road to home with Jesus is wide, but it's also narrow. And we need to understand this. Because it is only by this baby named Jesus that a person can be saved. There's no other name that will save you except the name of Jesus Christ. That's the best gift at Christmas every year. Salvation opportunity for those that would call him and choose him as Savior and Lord. We're reminded of this truth in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 it says salvation is found in no one else there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved only found in jesus christ remember jesus said i am the way not a way i am the way the truth not a truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through me the road to home with Jesus is narrow and wide. But we need to also remember this, that Christmas is an exclusive claim, but the most inclusive invitation in the world. Christmas is an exclusive claim. We're the only religion in the world that claims that the Son of God put on flesh and made his dwelling among us and has the historical accuracy to say, oh yeah, this Jesus guy actually did exist. Even extra-biblical accounts of Jesus doing miracles, of who Jesus was and what he did. We're the only ones. We're exclusive in that way. It's a very exclusive claim, but it's the most inclusive invitation to all of the world because he came to have a relationship with everyone. And it doesn't matter where you feel like you're at in your life this morning. When Jesus came, he also came for you. You see, Christmas says that there's room at God's home for everyone. There's room at God's home for everyone. Do you remember John 14, 2? Jesus was in the upper room with the disciples, and he told the disciples, in my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to make a room just for you so you can be a part of my house and my family. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this. Remember what just happened before this in 10 and 11. It says he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, they did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. They would not receive him. And verse 12 says this. Yet to all who did receive him. To all of those who did make him room. To those who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. You are, have the opportunity to be God's kid. God's child. You can be in the family. And you can call God's house home. It's because of this baby that we celebrate at Christmas. You have to understand, folks, there's a lot of people that are going to celebrate Christmas this year. But there's also going to be a lot of people that are going to miss Christ. They'll celebrate Christmas, but they'll, they'll miss Christ. James Dobson shared this story of a family that was uh, living in Colorado. They had this tradition as a family. It was a rule, and it was a family with lots of kids, you know, five or six kids. And they had this rule that all of their bedrooms were upstairs. And the family rule was on Christmas morning, no one comes downstairs and looks underneath the tree until everyone's up and we'll all go down together as a family. And it was a sacred moment for all of them. 
And so they found themselves a little bit annoyed when little Johnny got up. He was seven years old and ran into their bedroom at 4.30 in the morning and said, Mom, Dad, I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. And they were like, oh, no. Johnny broke the rule. (laughs) He went downstairs. You see, the fact is that he'd been wanting a bicycle for like two years. And they were finally able to get him the bicycle that he wanted. It was under the tree. And so they were sure that Johnny had gone downstairs and snuck a peek and had seen the bicycle under the tree. And he was so excited. And so the parents were like, man, he broke a rule. But at the same time, they were like, you know what? It's Christmas. We don't want to be Christmas Grinches. So they belaboringly (laughs) began to wake up all of the kids at 4.30 in the morning. And little Johnny leading the whole family down the stairs and and the family's following and they get to the bottom of the stairs and the tree is over here like to the left with all the presents and everything under it. Johnny doesn't even look that way. He immediately turns right and heads toward this window and he's got his mom and dad's hands. He's, He's grabbed them. He's running to this window away from the tree, away from the presents and all of that. And he said, Mom, Dad, see, I saw it. I told you I saw it. And they're like, what, what? And he, he comes over to the window and he pulls back the curtain. It's the star. And he goes, it's the star of Bethlehem. It's Jesus' star. It's a reminder to us. Folks, forget the bike. See the star. Because the star points toward home. And Jesus came at Christmas because he wants you to be home with him. And today could be the day that you say yes to him. Because at the end of this service, we're going to have the opportunity There's going to be some elders and staff down here. Make Jesus home this Christmas.